Good afternoon to all. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce a friend and one of the most prominent scholars of Brazil, Professor Renato Machado Cota. Professor Renato Machado Cota has his bachelor degree in mechanical nuclear engineering from Federal University of Rio and the, his PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from North Carolina State University. In 1987, he joined the Mechanical Engineering Department of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is the author of around 5,500 technical papers, nine books, and he was the supervisor of about 82 PhD and master theses. He is the honorary advisor, editorial board. He was in honorary honorary editorial board in various journals, such as International Journal of Mass Transfer, International Journal of Thermoscience, International Do Journal of Numerical Methods in Heat and Fluid Flow, and so on. He, he was president of Brazilian Association of Mechanical Science. He's member of Scientific Council of International Center of Heat Mass Transfer, Executive Committee of ICHMT, and he was the recipient of the ICHMT Hart and Arvine Award in 2009 and 2015, and elect member of the National Award of Scientific Merit in Brazil, 2009. He was the president of the National Commission of Nuclear Energy from 2015 to 2017. He is the technical counselor of and General Directorate for Nuclear and Technological Development of Brazilian Navy since June 2017. Presently, he, is, he has a visiting professorship at the Mechanical Department, University College, London, UK. Thank you, Professor Renato Cota. Uh, good evening, everyone. I received this invitation with, with extreme honor, uh, made by Professor Attila Silva Freire and Professor Kimo Rangelic, uh, to talk today. Uh, and they particularly asked me to give an overview of uh, both the, the academic work that we do and the applications, especially in nuclear engineering since uh, we have been very much devoted to the nuclear applications in the, uh, along the years, and most especially do, during those years that I was in charge of our regulatory body and our science promoter, which is the National Commission of Nuclear Energy. So it was a difficult task. I must confess that I'm not sure I have been very successful. I have hidden all the equations. So in the questions, if someone asks, a uh, uh, question about the, the equations, we can have a look, but otherwise we wouldn't have an overview. It would be hard to, to have an overview. This, this article is co-authored by very close collaborators, Professor John Su, who is here with us, who works in the Nuclear Engineering Department of our university, Dr. Auro Potendero, who is a regulatory uh, technician. He works for the Navy. He works in the Nuclear uh, Safety Agency for the Brazilian Navy, and Kleber Lisboa, who is our uh, PhD student. Okay, so basically, uh, I'll try to give you a, a very quick background on this kind of hybrid methods of this mixing of analytical and, and numerical ideas to try to explain why we got into that and why we insisted in, 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 in working in, in this direction. And the importance of this kind of approaches in, in the developments that we will try to show uh, in, in the applications. But before getting to the applications, I want to give a very brief idea 
of how is nuclear energy in Brazil uh, doing right now. And finally, talk of just one slide about what we are doing for the next few years, what we are planning to do for the next few years. Okay, it all starts uh, with our uh, mentor, Fourier, who came up in his, in his treatise in 1822, not only with the formulation, not only with the uh, uh, constitutive relations that would allow us to study uh, heat conduction, but he was also uh, uh, obliged to, as a byproduct, to develop a method of solution of the kind of equations, of the kind of partial differential equations that he was uh, uh, proposing. It's a very curious reading. I particularly suggest to the um, to the graduate students to go back to the old to the old treatises and and try uh, to enjoy this vision, enjoy the the the, the capacity that that this genius had uh, sometimes 200 years before our our time. So. He was saying already in 1822 that the partial differential equations that govern heat transfer, they, they are very simple. Sometimes they are not, but at that time he found them, them, them very simple. But the methods of solution of that time were tools for solving those partial differential equations. And he says furthermore, a little bit ahead, that without a solution, without an analytical solution, those equations that he had derived they are not more useful, they are not less hidden, uh, the truth, than it was before when he was trying to, uh, to understand the physics. So, without an analytical solution, he couldn't really interpret uh, what was going on behind that, that phenomenon. So, he says that besides proposing the, the differential equations for heat transfer, he was also offering the, this, the solutions of those equations in terms of known functions, so that we could take, make conclusions without one single computation. So, this was the, the, the original words of uh, Fourier. I also mention here, with special emphasis, three treatises that came afterwards. One by academician Koshilyakov <coughs> from uh, Russia, which in a book in 1936, probably provided the very first solution, the very systematic way of solving non-homogeneous partial differential equations. Still linear partial differential equations at that time, exact analytical solutions. But he was the first, the first one that actually provided uh, solutions for non-homogeneous equations, either in the equations or, or in the boundary conditions. Then, of course, uh, uh, academician Luikov, which is much better known, He's a, he, he was a heat transfer man himself, which in, uh, in his treatise on analytical heat diffusion theory, he, he not only brings the work of Koshelyakov into, into heat transfer, who, this was a more, more mathematically oriented work, but he also uh, proposes the combined and uses of integral transforms and Laplace transforms for large and small time, time scales. So he provides also uh, solutions for new classes of problems, such as heat and mass transfer in drying, capillary porous bodies. So he provides a series of extensions of the problems uh, in principle, much, much beyond the, the pure heat conduction problem. And finally, the work that influenced me mostly was the work by uh, professors Mihailov and Ojuzik. Professor, uh, I was very lucky to work with both of them in, in the early 80s in, in North Carolina. And they classified, they gather uh, heat and mass diffusion theory to seven classes of problems, seven very general classes of problems. And they provide exact solutions uh, for any general uh, region, for any number of dimensions, one, two, or three. They provide general solutions for this class, uh, class of problems. So always, it's good to, to have a look whether the problem you are trying to solve does not have an exact solution ready to be used, ready to be used in uh, this uh, treatise. Professor Milan Hailov came to us. He spent 20 years here in Brazil working in our lab. 
And uh, so his influence uh, can be noticed all over Brazil uh, uh, since he has a series of followers in these classes of uh, hybrid numerical analytical approaches. Well, let's look very quick look also to finite difference methods because it's also very important to, to all of us. It's the origin of, of the purely numerical methods. So now, another uh, quite pioneering work back in 1911, <coughs> Professor Richardson proposed the, the arithmetical solution by finite difference of physical problems involving differential equations. It's a beautiful reading also. It's a beautiful reading how much they could predict, the, how much they could uh, uh, view uh, 100 years ahead of that time. There is something interesting. If you look here, he says, both for engineering and for many of the le less exact sciences, such as biology, don't, don't tell that to your biologist friends, uh, to, to your uh, bi uh, biomedical engineering friends. Uh, there is a demand for rapid methods, easy to, to be understood and inapplicable to unusual equations in irregular bodies. He was, he was always very much concerned about uh, complicated domains. If they can be accurate, so much the better. Yes, but 1% would suffice for many people. I'll be, I would be happy one, with 1% today. I mean, in 1911, he was saying that 1% was, well, 1% is okay. I would be very happy if everything would come out with 1% of uh, uncertainty or error. It's hoped that the methods put forward in this paper will help to supply this demand. But he also confesses that analytical methods are the foundation of the whole subject. And in practice, they are the most accurate, and they will work, but in the integration of partial equations, with reference to irregular shaped boundaries, their field of application is very limited. So that was his worry at, at that time, irregular shaped boundaries. 1911, we are talking 1911. So, Let's talk about the, the, the so-called hybrid methods, either numerical analytical, computational analytical, there are several ways of calling them. First of all, the reasons for their, for their existence uh, goes through the importance of analytical solutions themselves. Exact solutions, they are always computationally costless and within user prescribed accuracy, though might not be available if the problem gets more complicated. Of course, there is a barrier. There is a, a barrier for the kind of problems that you can solve through uh, an analytical approach to produce an exact solution. But once you do, you have minimal computational effort. You can, you can extract trends, you can extract asymptotic behaviors, you can derive, you can integrate, you can uh, find minima, mas maxima, and so on. And you can do parametric analysis and limiting uh, analysis very easily. It's very little computational effort. And everyone that works in numerical methods knows that having benchmark results is the best of life. Uh, Sometimes you have benchmark results for very simple problems that can be masking the most important problems in your more, more difficult uh, nonlinear uh, situation. So it would be better to have totally independent benchmarks uh, using this class of hybrid methods that you could uh, uh, refer, you could compare uh, with your fully uh, discrete solutions. Symbolic computation also made a big difference, made these approaches much more straightforward and feasible. Intensive computational tasks, that's one of our strongest uh, bet. That's where we, we bet for this class of problems, is when you have computationally intensive uh, computations that are, that are very usual, such as optimization, inverse analysis, and simulation now uh, stronger every day getting stronger simulation under uncertainty. And finally, you can use analytical methods to bridge the proposition of uh, new hybrid methods that mix numerical and analytical. Still have lots of open ideas, lots of works that have started and did not progress much that can be revisited, and new ideas that can come out uh, from mixing and differentiation and the uh, local local formulation 
try to reduce the model as much as possible, but not just a, like a classical lumped system analysis, but like an improved lumped analysis when you can control the error of this uh, model defensage reformulation approach. For the direct problem, as I mentioned before, we use a lot of integral transforms, numerical analytical integral transforms. We do a lot of inverse analysis for parameters and functions identification. Experimental analysis, of course, all the time. You have to feed in your inverse analysis with some real experimental data and symbolic computation throughout. Symbolic computation is really the tool, the, the, the appropriate tool for those that work on analytical type of approaches. Uh, today I'll talk very briefly about this coupled integral equation approach only and about the generalized integral transform technique. Just as an example on uh, mathematical model reformulation and on direct problem solution. We don't have time to talk about uh, inverse analysis and how uh, these two approaches can improve the inverse analysis to make uh, the gains, to make the gains of a hybrid method even more evident, even more uh, clear. What the coupled integral equations approach does is it reduces the number of independent variables and, and multidimensional PDEs. Whenever you can uh, neglect the local information and o work only with the average information, if you don't need local information in that specific coordinate, but you'd like to account for all the influence of that lumped uh, coordinate, you, you are produce, you are trying to produce a reduced model. This has been used for diffusion, convection diffusion, reaction convection diffusion, eigenvalue problems themselves, boundary layer equations, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, and then that's what, when the, the gain is more evident for optimization, inverse analysis, and simulation under uncertainty, which are the really computationally intensive tasks. Uh, we tried, along the years, we tried to, to register, to make this approach more popular, uh, so we tried to register that in different books. I must uh, uh, mention this very first book was very important. We, we still use it a lot. Then being, being invited for the numerical heat transfer handbook was a, was a good sign of, uh, that we were collaborating, that we were being useful in producing benchmarks, and, and more recently in the handbook of thermal science and engineering. Well, so that's just to give you the general idea of these uh, hybrid methods that we have extensively used in these nuclear applications that I'll try to briefly mention here. But let me give you a general overview of nuclear energy in Brazil. This is the electricity matrix in Brazil, which is, uh, this one is probably 2014. I did not even change it because we came into an economic and political crisis, not too much different, okay? But the fact is that uh, we are 70, more than 70% renewables only on hydro. So more than 70% of, of hydro. You see, eolic is growing a little bit, biomass also very, very significant. Uh, natural gas, 11%. And nuclear is here. Not, not too much oil. Coal also not so, so important, 2%. But nuclear is only 2.5. It, it has been 3% already, but 2.5. So it's not really our, uh, our big aim is not to have more and more nuclear power stations at least not at the pace that we could imagine, because we, we still have this. But this, there's a tendency of saturating. Uh, now it's more and more difficult to have good uh, electric hydro power stations because we're starting to, to, to need very large extensions of land with all the environmental impact that, that that could bring. But there is a synergy in Brazil, first of all, we are the sixth known reserve, six and seven, depends on the year, of known reserve of, of, of uranium, with less than 50% of our territory prospected. Uh, we have total domain of the nuclear fuel cycle. As I mentioned to you, uh, one of the applications that I'm going to show is uh, in uranium enrichment by, by ultra centrifugation, which was a process developed entirely, developed here. And uh, this also, 
has been extended to the processing of the nuclear fuel itself after enrichment of the nuclear pellets. So we have all of the, all of the nuclear cycle up to the power station, and we have operational experience with uh, PWR. We are signees of non-proliferation agreements, all of them, and we have intensive use of nuclear energy in industry, medicine, agriculture, safety. Myself, I'm going to uh, do some exams with Technesio this Thursday because my heart is a little bit uh, strange. So I'm, I'm going to use some of the, those radio tracers uh, this coming Thursday. So besides that, we have to protect our, what we call our blue Amazon. So it's an ex extension of the coast of Brazil, which is larger than, than the green Amazon it itself, and richer, much richer in terms of minerals, much richer. Of that. And uh, this has uh, triggered the Brazilian Navy nuclear program 30 years ago, is towards the, the construction of the first nuclear submarine. So uh, with, with, a, with a joint work with, of the Navy, with the civilian partners, uh, either universities and the National Commission of Nuclear Energy, we came up with the first uh, land prototype. It's a 75 megawatts land prototype nuclear reactor for the propulsion of our uh, very first nuclear submarine. So this is a very long-term project. About it started about 30 years ago. So uh, from mining, from uranium mining to conversion of uh, uranium hexafluoride to uranium enrichment and everything, we go all the way to the nuclear reactor. So this is a combination of work between civilian and Navy partners in a very uh, 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 collaborative effort. Besides that, we are very much engaged in uh, building our multi-purpose reactor for producing uh, radio traces. For, for producing radio tests for medicine and industry, agriculture, but also as a, as, as a research lab with, with neutron lines, with very strong and clean neutron lines, and for the testing of materials for the next generation of nuclear reactors. If you cannot test your materials, you, you cannot design, you, you become fully dependent of those countries that can test nuclear materials in, in very large radiation. And one project that I, I'm very much involved with myself is in the nuclear desalination. Again, it's a joint project with civilian and, and the Navy. We are making use of the submarine reactor, the submarine reactor that, 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 that has been developed, to propose, you see, those regions in red and yellow is where we have low quality water or where we don't have water at all. So you see that many regions in Brazil, especially in the, in the Northeast, but also in Sao Paulo, also in the south of Brazil, you might have a low quality and low quantity of water. And this hydric stress is becoming a problem in, uh, in, in certain years. So uh, nuclear desalination became a very interesting option in using membrane desalination using waste heat, not uh, reverse osmosis, not to use the, the electricity. So with a, with a 75 megawatts reactor, for example, you could pro produce electricity for just 100,000 people in the pattern of consumption of the office, but you could produce water for 1,400,000. So it's a, it's a very interesting use of nuclear, of nuclear energy. Okay. Uh, Julian, how much time do I have? I, I get 10 minutes? Okay. So I'm, I'll sh just show two, two brief examples. There are a few others in the paper which are not the same one. I try to uh, to enrich, giving different examples. This is our uranium mining e installation in uh, Kaitite. It's a city in, in the northeast. Uh, it is, you can see it's a very uh, well taken care uh, plant, which produces the so-called yellow cake for uranium enrichment. So 400 tons of yellow cake per year. So we worked for a few years on the environmental impact assessment. You see, what we are seeing here, this is the top of a mountain of spent ore. You attack the ore, you, 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 you mill it, you grind it, and then you attack with, with sulfuric acid solution to destabilize the, the uranium from the ore. And then you are left 
After you wash it, you are left with some spent or uh, some um, leached or that still contain radioisotopes. So you have to be be, be sure that you're gonna you're not gonna have leaching uh, for 50,000 years of that uh, radioisotope material. So this environmental impact assessment requires lots of characterization. You see, these are huge mountains of not only rocks but also of these uh, uh, leached ores. So this is probably myself, I'm here on the top taking the picture, I guess here is Professor Sujan, here is my wife, everyone working very hard. I, I'm in the top, of course, the coordinator, so, but they are, they are taking, they are entrenched, taking samples of the soil, taking trenches of the ore, so that we could take to the lab and characterize the hydraulic properties and characterize also, most important, the transport properties. How do, how do you characterize that? First of all, you need to do the inventory of the uranium, thorium, radium, and, and lead that were left in, in that mountain. You have to know how much uh, radioisotope is still there because that's your source term. That's, that's your source term. Uh, so in principle, then you propose a physical model of leaching uh, and the geochemical effects on how you remove from this uh, uh, spent ore, from this leached ore, how you, how you can still leach the, uh, the other radioisotopes, and how the, 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 this material along these mountains carried to the basins, to the basins in that region, and then how it's carried to, to the aquifers, and how this underground underground water migrates this contamination out of the installation. You have to, to be sure that in 50,000 years there is no significant leaching that is uh, under the control of the regulatory body. You cannot pay, allow for a dose, a larger dose, uh, either in, in meat, in milk, in plants, uh, excavation. If people decide 10,000 years from now they decide to make a house in that site, you, you are not gonna be there to say anything. So you have to be sure that people cannot be contaminated by that, uh, by those, those, those radioisotopes. So you have to solve a flow problem, which is uh, a very nonlinear problem. The, the hydraulic conductivity can be very, very nonlinear, uh, very in more than 10 orders of, of magnitude. This is the Van Genuschen model for the hydraulic uh, conductivity, and you have to work e either with the head or, or the water content and combine the flow problem with the transport problem in the radioactive chain. So normally you have no, no equilibrium physics, you have mobile and immobile uh, groundwater, you have regions trapping in the water, you have regions that allow flow, flow to grow through, so you have to consider the exchange between mobile and then we'll buy our regions, which increases the number of parameters that you have to characterize, okay? So basically, you have to take that into consideration and take different samples of soils, take different samples of ore, so that you can do experiments which are accelerated experiments. Of course, we cannot wait for 50,000 years, but uh, in principle, we do accelerated experiments to come up with the hydraulic and, and the transport properties. We have estimated with the inverse analysis uh, 11 parameters in one single column experiment. So we didn't have to do experiments for each parameter. Just having a good model and have a good uh, set of experiments for your soil samples, for your ore samples, you could uh, produce a very good uh, recovery with very small residues of your uh, geochemistry and of your transport uh, radioactive migration. At the end, that's what you're looking for. You are looking for doses, you're looking for concentrations in terms of becquerel per liter for each radioisotope. And from those concentrations in the first few years and then in the, at, at the circular equilibrium at your years and then in the at, at the circular equilibrium, at your steady state, as, as, as we could say, you can compute the dose and demonstrate if those are acceptable in terms of regulatory body um, or not. Finally, 
let me quickly talk about fuel elements fabrication and uh, the uranium enrichment process, which we started here back in, in the 80s, in the, in the early 80s. As soon as, as I got back from North Carolina, I was captured for this project and, and worked in this project for more than, than 15 years. So basically, what we have is a, <clears throat> is, is a cylinder that levitates inside a, a cask. You have electromagnetic uh, berries. You cannot have uh, mechanical berries, otherwise uh, friction would be too high. They would last a few hours. You, you rotate uh, at speeds at frequencies larger than, than 1,000 hertz, six, 60,000 rotations per, uh, per minute. You, you don't hear anything. You don't know even know if the machine, except for the light blinky, you don't know if the machine is turning or not. Unless it, it falls. It falls, that means if it gets out of its, its axis, then makes a terrible noise. Then uh, you can run for days before people can stop you because it's a very strong noise, very uh, disturbing noise. So this is a typical uh, ultra, ultra centrifugation uh, cascade. You enrich a little bit in each pass, in each ultra centrifuge, and you do that. Once you, 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 turn, you turn this around at 60,000 RPM, you establish a uh, rigid body movement, basically. So there's nothing we, you, you, you can do with that. But if you put a scoop here, a little wing here, and a little wing there, which are important for collecting the reject and collecting the, the depleted and the enriched uh, uranium, it also promotes a secondary flow. It also promotes this um, recirculating flow that at the end is what you're looking for. You want to move as you, as you turn around, you want to move this so as to collect the depleted and the, and the enriched portions. Then you have uh, the flow rate of feeding, the height of feeding, diameter of the ultra centrifuge, uh, height of the, of, of, of the ultra centrifuge, the position of collection, the position of collection of, the, of depleted and, and enriched. You have nine, nine parameters to optimize. So it's a very complicated problem in terms of the flow, in terms of the diffusion, you, 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 your, your separation is basically by the atomic mass difference of three units, uranium-238 that you don't want, and uranium-235 that you're looking for. So you smash the, the, the uranium-238 closer to the wall, and you have more uranium-235 a little bit away from the wall. So Navier-Stokes equations, uh, three, three velocity components uh, in, in cylindrical coordinates, Vr, V theta, Vz, and of course it's a compressible flow, so you also have the energy equation, equation of state, and the, diffusion, and the convection diffusion equation for the migration of, of, of the two species, which is not shown here, uh, but you have also one additional nonlinear equation for the uh, convection diffusion of the uranium-238 with respect to the 235. So at the end, you look for profiles of the axial mass velocity that shows an ascending flow uh, a little bit away from the wall and a descending flow very close to the wall. Of course, it can be just the opposite. If you, depends on how you move, how you do your drive of, of the two scoops. But uh, it's, it's a field where you don't find many many benchmarks. So we had one single work by Dixon and Jones that we could compare. And that only single work gave us this very beautiful comparison. This is a finite difference solution. And, uh, and the, the dots are the finite difference solution. And the solid line is the fully converged uh, uh, integral transform solution for a certain range of parameters here. Of course, we also analyzed conversions at very low eigenfunction expansions. We are not fully converged. Once you increase, that's just a demonstration because the code itself finds for the optimum, finds for the optimum truncation orders. But you can see that uh, convergence comes uh, just afterwards a little bit with 240 terms in the eigenfunction expansions. You cannot see any difference more between in the different, uh, among the different curves.
So two different situations, two, two different sets of parameters to show the consistency of, of the convergence. Then all kinds of velocity field contours, and most important, the separation performance optimization, how we can get to those maximums in terms of separation factor, how we can get uh, the, the optimal machine. If we had to do that experimentally, this we would still be doing it. So uh, each machine, each, each of these machines used to cost $100,000. So if you make one and it doesn't work, you're just going to throw it out. So it, it doesn't matter if you can make a very nice uh, uh, campaign, experimental campaign, it would be uh, impossible work to accomplish without simulation. And measuring inside that ultra centrifuge is also another difficult that's kind of impossible all you can do is get input and output so you only had have the overall uh, results okay okay let me skip this one this is a passive storage of spent nuclear fuel it's a typical natural convection problem just talk about the the future very quickly what we are doing now we are dealing more and more the, the challenges are coming to us in mixing scales, geometries and, and properties. Uh, media with different scales, uh, uh, especially, but also with different uh, properties. And we are taking this to the eigenvalue problems. We are more and more dealing with uh, multi-scale eigenvalue problems because that's making our numerical part of the work much lighter. We don't want to complicate our numerical part, otherwise we lose the charm. So we try to bring all the difficulties of the mode scaling to the eigenvalue, to, to the eigenfunction expansions to, to the analytical part of the problem. More and more we are dealing with convective eigenvalue problems. We are taking some advantage of taking convective effects to the nonlinear no eigenvalue problem. We started dealing with another challenge that's coming to us, petroleum petroleum company uh, brings this every day, how to deal with media, with multi-phase media, uh, if you can bring this information on, on the change of the media into the, again, the eigenvalue problem formulation. Coupled eigenvalue problems, that's very important for reaction problems. And finally, this is, this is the future. We have uh, still only a few works on this, but uh, and uh, that's our great bet for the future, is taking the nonlinearity to the eigenvalue problem. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Once again, Professor Attila and Professor Kim, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm extremely honored. And uh, my, my collaborators that are, I have already mentioned, our sponsors from the works that I talked here today, our students and collaborators that did all of the work, and Marie Curie, of course, a uh, final quote by her. Who, who at that time, for the lack of knowledge, sacrificed her life, but she has led to us uh, very, very big lessons and uh, uh, extremely important technology like the one that's going to favor me on Thursday and Friday when I do my scintillography of my cardiac uh, scintillography. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Renato, for your uh, great lecture. Are there any questions for him? Uh, well, I, my name is Jung, and um, I'm from the uh, Seoul, South Korea. And um, actually, I didn't expect that I would hear about the uh, nuclear program, nuclear technology in Brazil. It's a kind of a surprise to me. So I'd like to ask a kind of a general question rather than a technical one. So I wonder, I wonder, you know, uh, whether the Brazilian government, you know, nuclear power program, it costs a lot, and um, it needs a lot of infrastructure too. So, so it requires the uh, public support as well as the, uh, you know, uh, government support too. So I wonder whether the, the Brazilian, Brazilian government supports and the public also, you know, uh, favors the nuclear, you know, power in Brazil. And the other one is that, you know, uh, Brazil has uh, lots of energy sources. You have hydro, you have gas, and I, I guess and you have oil too. So I wonder whether nuclear energy is competitive in market, you know, electricity market too. So that's a general question that I could get an answer. Okay. Through uh, a scientist that was also 
an admiral of the navy, and he was our in in the in the late 40s. He was our representative in the in the United Nations for for nuclear uh, for for the nuclear program. At that time, the situation uh, is that Brazil would be out of the game. At that time, Brazil would be out of the game. It would be a provider of uranium, and that's all. And we would buy everything. We would buy all, all the technology. So he made the decision of going against that. He convinced the, the politicians back in Brazil. And he uh, came with a three treats in the, the United Nations that we would sell, surely we would sell uranium, but we would sell it for technology. Because he, he already had the strategic uh, notion that we would eventually need it. We would eventually need nuclear energy not only for the, for the electricity generation. At this moment, of, perhaps it's the less important need. But we are very much dependent on uh, radio tracers. For example, we buy, we, today we provide two million exams like this one that I'm going to make next, next Thursday. And, uh, and except Brazil and Argentina, all the other countries in South America, they have to come here. Otherwise, we will have to go to the US or, or to Europe. So medicine, nuclear medicine in Brazil is only strong. It only exists because we insisted in developing our own nuclear technology since the late 40s. So right now, we, so we, we provide only two million exams like this. Our needs, our, our basic needs are six million. So to reach six million, we need that multipurpose reactor. We, we need that multi-purpose reactor that we ha started developing in 2008, and it will be ready in a, in a few years. Then we can all, not only be a, a producer for our own needs, because this, this reactor is gonna multiply this potential by 10. We can also provide for the whole of South America. So we can have nuclear medicine, which saves uh, millions of lives in the whole world. Uh, I doubt it that any, uh, everyone here has in his family, someone had uh, some kind of exam or therapy using uh, nuclear trace, nuclear radioism. It's essential, it's essential. And we were very much dependent, especially after the, the, the Canadian reactor stopped, which, which gave, uh, brought a crisis for the whole world. In fact, everyone was affected. Uh, there was a Canadian uh, reactor that was very important producer. And now we definitely need this uh, uh, reactor. The same about the desalination. We, we spent two, 23 billion to deviate a river to take water to the southeast. Now, when do we need water? We need water when we don't have that much flow in the river. When we deviate the, the river, the ocean is getting to the river and killing totally the, the natural habitats for different species. So this wouldn't have happened if we had a, a, a longer term project for nuclear desalination. With uh, only five of those reactors, we, we would produce three times more water than, than the deviation of, of this river. So you see there are some strategic aspects of nuclear energy for the country that go much beyond the, the electricity production. But even electricity production, what happens? Hydro is a very nice form of energy, but it's not, it's not where you need. It's far away. So we have lots of possibilities, and, and we do have lots of power stations in the north, in the, in the, in this, in the lower north of the country, or in the inner land in the southeast, where you have no industries. You have... Uh, 3,000 kilometers, 4,000 kilometers of transmission lines, losing lots of energy, with a, a big loss of energy. So you also uh, have this problem. And now, uh, the, 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 the very nice elevations, the, 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 the very nice exploratory spots, those, those are gone. Now you have to, to flood a region uh, as, as, as big as uh, uh, sometimes countries 
so that you can have a, a good amount of hydropower. So hydro is almost exhausted. Of course, we can still have some solar. Wind is not that good, but we are doing a, our, our job in the northeast. Uh, solar, in that dry region, solar is okay. Uh, but you, you won't be able with just those two to cover all, all of the needs, especially in the, where, where the industry are, uh, in the south and southeast of the country. So we certainly will have the need in the near future for some other nuclear stations. I see interesting, you know, things. You know, I learned some about something about the uh, situation, nuclear energy situation in the Brazil. That's a kind of a surprise to me. Thanks a lot. Thank you.